welcome everybody again. This is the fourth and final lecture of uh, Glenn Cohen on statistics, and I leave the floor to Glenn, please. Thank you, Albert. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for this fourth lecture, what I have in mind is the following, is that um, I had intended in lecture three to have a discussion of uh, experimental sensitivity. Uh, we didn't get to that, but that's quite important. So that's what I want to finish up uh, today. And then we'll go on and I want to show an example which uh, contrasts some frequentist methods and Bayesian methods. And it, it will serve at least for the frequentist part to review a number of the things and consolidate, I hope, some of the things discussed in the previous days. And then also to introduce how this would be done in a Bayesian uh, approach. And then unfortunately, what I've had to move to the extra slides is this brief discussion of students' T regression. That's slightly more exotic anyway. I invite you to look at that in the extra slides and, and uh, perhaps we can find some time to talk about that some other day. All right, so first of all, let me move on to this topic of experimental uh, sensitivity. Uh, I'm going to use for the example to illustrate this, the simple count, uh, Poisson counting experiment that we introduced yesterday. I'll, I'll recap that in just a second. I'm sure that what you've perhaps heard is that the sensitivity can be uh, characterized by S over square root of B. That's the, that's the quantity that keeps on getting bandied about. The expected number of signal events S divided by this expected number of square root of the expected number of background events. You can use that to, to characterize um, uh, the, the sensitivity of a counting experiment. I want to derive that and explain more carefully what that means. And then I want to argue that it's not really the formula we should be using. Rather, this formula here, slightly more complicated. Now, both of those two formulas assume that the expected number of background events is known exactly. And then I want to generalize those formulas to the case where the expected background might not be exactly known, which is usually the case. All right, so that's the plan. Let me review briefly this uh, Poisson counting experiment. The outcome of the experiment is a single number, n, that follows a Poisson distribution whose mean value is the sum of S and B, B the, being the expected number of signal events and the expected number of uh, background events. And so as we did yesterday, I want to test um, for discovery of the signal process by computing the p-value of the hypothesis that I only have background, the hypothesis of the S equals, the, the p-value of the S equals zero uh, hypothesis. And so that would be the probability under the assumption of s equals zero to see as many events as I observe or more. Right? This is basically the example we worked out yesterday. I have these sum of Poisson probabilities then. And I mentioned there's a trick that you can use to relate this uh, uh, sum of, of Poisson probabilities to the cumulative chi-squared distribution. That's just a, very, a numerical trick that allows you to compute this p-value uh, in a simple way. And once you get the p-value, you usually convert that to this equivalent Gaussian uh, significance by taking the standard Gaussian quantile, uh, sorry, the, yes, the standard Gaussian quantile phi inverse of uh, one minus P. So that will give you the significance in a number of sigmas. And very often in particle physics, we say if that number is greater than five, that corresponds to a, a discovery of the new effect. That would correspond to a p-value less than uh, three times 10 to the minus seven. Now, those are the numbers that you would give when you actually do the measurement, right? So you get n and you report the number. But how about when you're in the planning phase of the experiment? You want to go to your funding agency and convince them that if they give you the money to, to do the experiment, then if this signal process exists, then you really will find it. So what we would like to do to characterize that sensitivity is to give the mean, mean value of the significance that you expect if the signal, signal is actually present and gives uh, an expected number of signal events S. Why do I say expected? Well, because of course, the significance is a function of the number of events that you find N, so it itself is a random variable. But I, 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 ahead of time, I don't know exactly what N would be. Even if I knew both S and B, N is a random variable. So what I wanna do is I wanna give something like the mean uh, or perhaps median significance under the assumption of a given uh, value for S, all right? So now here's the first simple way of doing that. And that's the following. This is gonna lead to the famous S over root B. The mean of the Poisson distributed variable N 
that's S plus B. And what I can do is I can exploit the fact that for a very large value of the mean, the Poisson distribution starts to look like a Gaussian distribution. All right, so I can call that a continuously distributed variable X. So I'll replace N by what I'll call X. Its mean, of course, is still S plus B. And the standard deviation, as is the case also for the Poisson, is the square root of S plus B. All right, so then in the large, in the limit of large S plus B, this Poisson distribution can be replaced by this uh, Gaussian. So suppose I, I say, all right, S, S and B is sufficiently large, so I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to test uh, the hypothesis that S is equal to zero by computing the corresponding p-value. So instead of the probability to find n greater than or equal to n observed, I'm, I'm going to use this Gaussian distributed x. It's just a different name for the same thing under the hypothesis of S equals zero. All right, so that's just one minus the cumulative distribution for a Gaussian. All right, so that would be my formula for the p-value. It's just one minus the cumulative distribution of the corresponding Gaussian with a mean of b, because I'm assuming a, I'm hypothesizing s equals zero, and therefore the standard deviation is square root of b. Again, so because this formula for sigma uses s equals zero. So there's my p-value. All right, and if you actually did the measurement and you got a value of x, you could plug it in and, and get your number. Now, first, let's see, let's convert this to the corresponding significance. So that involves uh, applying phi inverse to uh, taking phi inverse of one minus the p-value. And so you'll notice that here we get a phi inverse and a phi, which uh, cancel each other out. And I'm left with a very simple formula for the significance. Namely, it's the value of the variable I observed, minus b over root b. Yeah, no, sorry. So that's the number that I would actually report. But if I want to give the expected value of that significance, well, then I need to take the expectation value of this quantity on the right-hand side. And how do I define expectation value? I want to know what value I would expect if the signal is actually present. And so I take the expectation value of this quantity under the assumption of S plus B for the, for the mean value. And the expectation value of X under S plus B is S plus B. And so therefore I get S plus B minus B over root B, that's my S over root B, done, all right? So remember, this is not the number that you report for an individual experiment. It's the number that you report in the planning phase of the experiment in order to characterize what significance you expect in a test of S equals zero, where that expectation assumes a particular value of S, slightly subtle. All right, I wanna argue that that's actually not a very good approximation uh, because we've, we've approximated this Poisson variable by a Gaussian distributed quantity, the approach to that asymptotic limit is rather slow. Um, so what I want to do is take a step back and recognize that the number of events that we measure is indeed Poisson distributed. And so therefore, the likelihood function as a function of the parameter s is just given by this Poisson distribution, right, with a mean of s plus b. And since I want to test the hypothesis of s equals zero, I can use the statistic that we introduced yesterday, namely minus log to uh, log of the likelihood ratio, the so-called profile likelihood ratio. But I'll, I'm going to assume that the alternative to s equals zero is some positive value of s. And so I'll use the version of the statistic that we discussed yesterday, namely that I'll only assign q zero equal to minus two log lambda if I see an excess of events over the background. So in other words, if the estimate of the signal rate comes out positive. On the other hand, if I see fewer events than expected by background alone, so S hat comes out negative, then I won't take that as constituting discrepancy between the, the data and the hypothesis. I'll just assign a value of zero to the statistic. All right, so I remind you that lambda here is described, is, is defined by the uh, profile likelihood ratio as I've written on the right. It's the likelihood of the hypothesized S divided by the maximum of the likelihood. And then if you have nuisance parameters, then they have to be evaluated in a particular way. But for now, I'm going to assume that B is known. And so there's, there are no nuisance parameters in the problem. Everything, so there are no nuisance parameters. It's just L of S divided by L of S hat. All right, so Q0 is therefore just given by this quantity uh, here. 
when does s hat come out positive? It's when n is greater than b. All right, so then you get this quantity here if you plug in the likelihood function from above, and then you assign zero if, if s hat comes out negative, so n is less than b. All right, so that gives me my value of q0 that I can calculate once I do the experiment and see n. And uh, so remember that one of the formulas we derived yesterday was that the significance uh, with which you reject the hypothesis of s equals zero is given by the square root of q0. So that's just given by the square root of that formula that I just derived uh, for q0. All right, that's again, that's if n is greater than b, and you, you say that the significance is zero otherwise. So that's the formula that you use to report the significance that you observe. But now again, let's, let's place ourselves in the context of the planning phase of the experiment. And I want to know what's the, say, mean or median value of Z if the signal process actually exists. So if I assume a particular value for S. Well, you can imagine trying to compute the expectation value of this quantity. You could do that with the Monte Carlo program. You couldn't do it in closed form very easily, right? You'd have to sum over all values of N with the Poisson probability of n times this you know, non-linear function, you, you, you couldn't do that sum in closed form. But there's a simple trick uh, that you can use, and that's the following. What you can do is you can simply take this formula and you can evaluate with a data set with a value of n in which you simply replace n by its expectation value. We call that a, an Asimov data set for obscure reasons that I won't go into now, but uh, the Asimov data set is the data set that you get by replacing all of the data values here simply by their expectation values. All right, and so I'll call that Z sub A for the uh, Asimov estimate of the, it's actually, it turns out to be a better estimate for the median rather than the mean, but that's kind of a technical point that we don't need to worry about. All right, so there's the formula. Now what's interesting about that formula, well, first of all, you can't memorize it quite in the same way as S over root B, or maybe you can. If you expand the logarithm and if you expand the whole thing in a Taylor series, uh, you will see that this reduces to s over the square root of b in the limit where s is small compared to b. So there is that point of contact. Right. Here's a, a sketch of a uh, well, plot of uh, the uh, expected significance as a function of b for three different values of s, s equals 2, 5, and 10. Now, the let me explain the plot. The dots are computed with the Monte Carlo model. So they make no asymptotic approximation. They make no approximation related to Wilkes theorem or to having a Poisson distribution be close or not to a Gaussian distribution. So they're exact in that sense. The fact that there are funny jagged structures here is an artifact of the discrete nature of the data. It's, it's an artifact of the discrete Poisson data. If I'd computed the mean instead of the median, those um, notches would not be there. But so don't worry too much about the notches. That is, they're not a mistake. They're an artifact of the discrete nature of the data. And then the blue curve is this uh, Asimov formula that I just computed. And the red dotted curve is S over root B. And you can see that they all agree if the expected number of background events gets very large. But it, if the expected number of background events is smallish, say one, and that's not unrealistic. There's many analyses that we carry out that have an expected number of background events of one or less. So suppose you considered, say, uh, an analysis that had B equals one, and a particular signal model predicted S equals five, and you're trying to prepare your experiment and, and convince your funding agency to give you the money for the experiment. You'd say, ah, well, based on S over root B, I expect to see uh, a significance of greater than five. So I think I'm going to be able to discover the process if it exists in nature. And so maybe they fund your experiment, but they, maybe they shouldn't have. Because in fact, if you'd used the more accurate formula, you can see here that the Monte Carlo calculation agrees much better with this Asimov formula, and it predicts more like a expected significance of four. All right, so it's, it's important to get these uh, numbers right because these expected significances, the so-called sensitivity values, are used for important decisions. They're used to decide what experiment to do and how to do the experiment. All right, so um, that's the first case I wanted to illustrate. That assumed the, the, the expected number of background events be 
was known. Now I want to quickly go through the case where B is uncertain because that's more more realistic. Um, you can imagine that uh, how do we interpret this quantity of root B that appears in the denominator of S over root B? Well, if if uh, the number of background events itself will follow a Poisson distribution with a mean of B, and the standard deviation of that is root B. So root B is the is the sort of expected level of statistical fluctuation in the background. And so you can understand S over root B as simply a ratio that compares the size of the signal to the expected um, uncertainty, if you will, in the, in the background or the expected level of fluctuation in the background. But now suppose the B itself is uncertain and it's characterized by an uncertainty sigma B. That could be, if you will, it's, that's the systematic uncertainty on B. And so since root B represents the statistical fluctuation in B, and then I have this other sigma B, which is like my systematic uncertainty, you might think, well, just take the two things and add them in quadrature, add the systematic and statistical uncertainties in quadrature and use that in the previous formula. And so then you would have S over the square root of B plus sigma B squared. And so that was a rather you know, hand wavy derivation but this has been used in the past with, I think, no more formal justification than what I just said. All right, it's just saying, oh, well, let's generalize the formula to, to use the quadratic sum of statistical and systematic uncertainties. And this has been used also to optimize some analyses. I wanna argue that you can do much better um, by, again, taking a, a step back and recognizing that the number of events that we measure is Poisson distributed. And then we should ask ourselves, what is the source of the uncertainty in B? How did we determine, how did we estimate B to begin with? And one of the common ways is that you estimate the expected number of background events by doing some kind of a control measurement, perhaps with a sideband, perhaps with some separate measurement. But you can imagine that I have my primary measurement, N, which is Poisson distributed with the mean of S plus B. And then I have my control measurement, M, which is Poisson distributed with a mean of some scale factor tau times B. So this is also the same example that I showed uh, yesterday. This is what's sometimes called, by the way, the on off problem. There's a, there's a literature on this that I've alluded to here. So the, the likelihood function we've seen yesterday, it is now a function of the parameter of interest S as well as a nuisance parameter B. And then this second Poisson term helps constrain or provides information on the nuisance parameter B. And so now the idea is to use this likelihood function in the profile likelihood ratio, uh, where I'm going to treat B in the way that I indicated uh, yesterday. Namely, uh, what I do is I evaluate B in the numerator with its profiled value at S equals zero, because I'm testing S equals zero. And then in the denominator, I simply have the maximum of the likelihood function. All right. So um, if you do that, let's see, you need all sorts of uh, estimators. You need S hat, you need B hat, you need B double hat. And it turns out for this particular problem, you can work them out in closed form. So that's kind of nice. Right? So there I've collected together all the necessary uh, ingredients. And if you put them then into the formula Z equals square root of Q zero, you get this formula here. All right, so that tells you then what the significance is for a test of S equals zero, um, having observed the two values, N and M. So the output of the full experiment is the uh, primary uh, count number N and the control experiment uh, result M. All right, so you get that formula there. Again, that, that's for if you see an excess of events and, um, and zero otherwise. All right, and so then there are some other uh, references where that was uh, uh, first derived. Now, this is the number you report when you actually do the experiment, but how about the expected significance? Well, here we can just use this trick that I alluded to earlier. Namely, you can use this so-called Asimov data set. You replace N by its expectation value S plus B, and you replace M by tau times B. And so that gives you then a formula that you can use to report the expected significance. Except this contains this scale factor tau, which is uh, uh, maybe not so convenient. But one of the things that you can do to uh, convert this formula into something more useful 
is that if you go back and you look at the formula for the estimator for B, that turns out to be M over tau. And M is just a Poisson distributed variable. So we can work out very easily the variance of that estimator. And that just turns out to be B over tau. And so we can use this formula here, or maybe I can write this. We can use this formula here to eliminate tau from the equation in the middle here uh, in favor of sigma b. And that gives me then the expected significance in terms of s, b, and sigma b. And that turns out to be a quite useful formula. And so if you take it, sorry, let me go back. You'll see that there are two logarithmic terms. And if you expand the whole thing in a Taylor series, then lo and behold, what you get is the following, is that you get um, uh, s over the square root of b plus sigma b squared plus higher order terms, plus terms of order s over b and sigma b squared over b, which is, is the same as one over tau. So in any case, there is this intuitive formula does have some formal justification as a, a limiting case of this uh, formula that we just derived. So let me show a plot. And uh, let's see, here then is the uh, uh, expected significance as a function of b. And this is for s equals 5. And the two different sets of curves correspond to two different values for the relative uncertainty in the background, 20% and 50%. And the red curves use the, the naive formula. And the uh, solid blue curve is the Asimov formula that I just derived. And then the dotted points again are from a Monte Carlo calculation. So they still have a, some notches because of the Poisson nature of the data. That gets washed out because I have two Poisson distributed quantities, n and m. And when I combine them together, the notches somehow get smoothed out. But the basic conclusion is very similar to before, namely the uh, Asimov approximation based on the Poisson likelihood uh, is a very good approximation for the exact Monte Carlo answer. So if you were to uh, have an analysis with b equals one or even smaller, uh, then you can see that using the naive formula would massively overestimate the uh, uh, expected significance. So maybe your experiment gets funded, but that would be completely unfair. You should, you should, you should use the, uh, the correct curve. And you should not only do that to request your funding, you should use that to optimize your analysis. When I set up my Poisson counting experiment, what I typically do is I uh, delineate a certain region of phase space. I make cuts on the various kinematic variables, and then I count the number of events that pass those cuts. So that's how I define n. So suppose that I had some variable x, and that was one of the variables that I was going to cut on to, divide, to define my, my search region. And so let's suppose that this variable x is distributed according to this red curve for the background events and according to this blue curve for the signal events. And I want to first make a cut on x and then just count my n events to the right of that cut. And so depending on where you make the cut, you'll get a certain value for s and a certain value for b and so forth. And if you plug those values for s and b into, say, the naive formula for the expected significance, then you would get this uh, red curve here. And so you'd look at the red curve and you'd say, ah, the, the best value for the cut would be over here around 50, 60 something. And furthermore, you expect apparently, I don't know, 12 or 13 for the expected significance. So you're very happy. You're sure you're going to find this thing and get funded. But if you were to actually use the, the more accurate formula, this Asimov formula, then uh, you can see that, in fact, the optimum cut value is not over here at, at uh, 60 something. It's much lower. Right? And furthermore, the expected significance is, is nowhere close to 13 sigma. It's not even 4 sigma, probably. All right, so using the right formula for the expected significance is, is, is important on, on several fronts. All right, I think that's all I have time to say about uh, uh, that. I would like to go on now and uh, so shift gears and talk about an example that will uh, consolidate some of the, uh, consolidate and extend, let me say, some of the things that we've been talking about in the last several days. And in particular, it will extend to uh, the Bayesian approach to parameter estimation. So let's consider the following example. Suppose I measure some data points. I measure some data values yi. And let me suppose that these yi's are independent and Gaussian distributed. 
uh, they have some standard deviations sigma i that are given. And the mean of the Gaussian is given by some function of a variable x i, you know, called that sometimes the control variable, and it's given, it's known as well. So, um, and I have n measurements, yes, and they're independent. So let me suppose that the uh, function that I'm hypothesizing for the mean of y is, contains some unknown parameters. And for this example, let me choose that just to be a straight line. It's got an offset parameter theta zero and a slope parameter theta one. And let's suppose that the goal of this analysis, in fact, is to measure the, off, the uh, y intercept theta zero. Right, so that's the value that I'm interested in, 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 in finding is that uh, uh, y intercept. I'm not interested in the slope parameter uh, per se. Maybe when I started doing this analysis, I didn't even think that y depended on x. You know, I was just going to take their average. And then maybe somebody comes along and says, ah, oh, you might have a systematic uncertainty if you do that. Because after all, the mean of y might depend on this uh, variable x. So you'd better insert another nuisance parameter into your model to account for that systematic uncertainty. I say, all right, fine. So I have to insert an, a nuisance parameter into my model. That takes into account the systematic uncertainty, but then there's going to be a price to pay for that. It's going to increase the uncertainty, uh, the statistical uncertainty in my estimate of the parameter of interest theta zero. So that's what I want to illustrate. Right. All right, so first of all, let's just solve this problem with maximum likelihood. Uh, I've said that the y sub i's are independent and Gaussian distributed. So therefore the likelihood function is simply a, a product of Gaussians. Right? And here's something I haven't pointed out up to this point, but it's kind of interesting to realize. And that is that um, when you take the log of the likelihood, remember it's equivalent to maximize the log of the likelihood, or equivalently you can minimize the negative log of the likelihood. And what we see here is that if you, if you calculate um, negative two times the log of the likelihood, that just turns out to be the sum of squares here up to a constant, up to an additive constant. And that sum of squares is what in physics is usually called the chi-squared. And so we see that maximizing the likelihood is equivalent to minimizing the chi-squared. And so that is what you would use to define what we call the method of least squares. And so that's an important point of contact. It says that for Gaussian uh, distributed data, the method of maximum likelihood is equivalent to this method of least squares. So let me go through a few cases now. Let me suppose that the nuisance parameter theta one were to be known exactly. So never mind how, but suppose somebody whispers in your ear the exact value of theta one. So really then you only have to treat the likelihood function as a function of the parameter of interest theta zero, right? So then I still have the same formula for the, for the chi-squared. So here's a sketch then of the chi-squared as a function of say just theta zero. So it will have a minimum at some point and that is my least squares estimator or equivalently my maximum likelihood estimator. Recall from last time we said that the recipe to get the uh, standard deviation was to look at the point where you move theta away from theta hat such that the log likelihood function uh, decreases from its maximum by one half. But now the chi-squared up to a constant is just minus two times the log of the likelihood. So the distance that you have to move the parameter to get the log likelihood function to decrease by one half will cause this chi-squared to increase by one, just because of that factor of minus two there, right? That converts the minus one half into a plus one. So that's another important recipe to keep in mind. How do you get the standard deviation of your estimator? Well, you move the parameter away from the estimator until the chi-squared goes up by one. All right, that was with theta one known. Now let's go back to the case where theta one is not known. I'm required to treat it as an adjustable parameter together with the parameter of interest, All right? Same formula for the for the chi-squared. So here now in the two-dimensional parameter space, uh, theta one versus theta zero, there will be some point where the chi-squared is a minimum, where the log likelihood function is a maximum. And now here's the two-dimensional generalization of this graphical method. I form essentially the same contour. That is to say, I find the contour in parameter space where the chi-squared goes up by one, namely log likelihood decreases from its maximum by one half. 
And then the rule is that you have to find the tangent planes or tangent lines to that contour and the distance that you move the parameter from its fitted value to that tangent line, that is what gives you the standard deviation. So for that recipe, we, we always use the offset one, or it's, it's for the log, log likelihood, it's minus one half. And don't get confused, for a confidence region, we might actually choose a different value instead of one uh, if we want to have a confidence region of a given size. But for purposes of finding the standard deviations of the estimators, it's chi squared equals chi squared min plus one, or log L equals log L max minus one half. Now, I mentioned that, uh, let's see, sorry, let me um, tr try to uh, address uh, another important point. If we were to go back to the example where theta one is known, let me suppose that theta one was known to be, say, right there. Right? What would the recipe tell us to do? It would say, start at the estimated value and go move theta zero until the chi-squared increases by one. And that would take me to this point here. And you'd say that that is the uh, standard deviation uh, of theta zero hat. But we can't do that exactly because theta one is not known in this problem. So therefore I can't stop here. I have to march over further until I get to here. So that illustrates how it is that introduction of the nuisance parameter decreased the sensitivity of our analysis to the parameter of interest. It caused the standard deviation of our estimate of theta zero to increase from what would have been that big to that big. So that's bad. How do we um, address that problem? Well, what you try to do is you try to set up some sort of a control measurement that provides information on the nuisance parameter. So let's suppose that we set up some additional measurement of a quantity of it I'll call T1. And it could be, say, a Gaussian distributed estimate of theta 1. And it will have some standard deviation sigma T1. All right, so uh, I, uh, I have done this, this control measurement. Let me suppose that it is independent of all of the other measurements, of all of the Y sub i's. And so therefore, the joint probability for both the primary measurements and the control measurement, that's just the product. Of the, of the Gaussians, right? So there's the Gaussian for the control measurement. There's the product of the Gaussians for the Y sub i's. And all right, so then if you calculate minus two times the log of the likelihood, uh, then up to a constant, you get this thing that we're calling the chi-squared. It has the original sum of squares for the primary measurements, the Y sub i's. And then it has this quadratic term for the control measurement. This is the kind of thing that you see a lot in an, in an analysis, and people will say, oh, I, yeah, I used method of least squares, and then I added a constraint term, or I added a penalty term to constrain the, the nuisance parameter. I even say that, and uh, it's, not, it's not wrong, but it makes, it makes it sound ad hoc. It makes it sound like that's not uh, derived from any sort of deeper principle. And we can see that it, it does derive from a deeper principle, namely, the, we're saying here that if I suppose that this control measurement is Gaussian distributed and independent, then the likelihood is just the product of these Gaussians and it, it, it emerges from that. All right, so in any case, this is the quantity then that we want to minimize. And if I look now again at this uh, two dimensional parameter space, theta one versus theta zero, here I've sketched in, as the dotted contour, the chi squared that you get if you don't include this additional quadratic term. And uh, it's, it's bigger. Whereas if you uh, include the quadratic term, it's the solid curve. And you can see that that has two effects. One is that it squishes the contour in the vertical direction, right? Because it's constraining theta one. And by squishing it in the vertical direction, it also squishes it in the horizontal direction. So it improves the standard deviation of the parameter of the estimate of the parameter of interest. So that's good. Right, that illustrates somehow the usefulness of constraining your, your nuisance parameters. All right, so that was just kind of a review and extension of the frequentist uh, approach. And what I'd like to do now is to um, illustrate how to treat the same problem uh, in the Bayesian approach. So let me review briefly what uh, we do in a, in a Bayesian analysis. Recall that in Bayesian statistics, you associate a probability not only with the data, but also with the parameters of the problem. So we can associate um, a probability with theta and treat it now not just as an unknown constant, 
but as a random variable in the sense that you ascribe a probability to it. And we interpret that probability using the subjective interpretation. So it's going to reflect our degree of belief as to where theta lies. But to do a Bayesian analysis, we need to start with a prior PDF. I'll call that pi of theta. And this ref reflects our degree of belief about where theta lies before you do the measurement. Now, we're going to do the experiment, and it will have some set of data. Here, I've just symbolically called that x for the, you know, the, the data in general. And there will be some likelihood here. Sorry, I'm kind of using my oldish notation. This is the same thing as the probability of the data uh, given the parameter. Sometimes when I use L, I'll just say L of theta, but the, it should be clear what I mean is the probability of the data given the parameter. And what a Bayesian wants is the posterior probability for the parameter given the data. And that is found using Bayes' theorem. So that's equal to the likelihood times the prior divided by the probability for the data, which can be expressed using this uh, law of total probability. This denominator, uh, really appears just as a normalization constant. So for present purposes, it will be sufficient to note that this posterior probability is simply proportional to the likelihood times the prior. And once you get that, this, uh, this posterior probability, that's your answer. That encapsulates all of your knowledge about where you think the parameter theta lies in, in the light of the data. Right, so let's now apply that to the problem at hand. So here the data has a different different name. We're calling the data values y sub i, and we said that they were Gaussian distributed um, according to this model. So that defines the, the likelihood. Now let's talk about the prior. We need to associate prior probabilities with both of the parameters. So that, that would be some joint probability density in theta 0 and theta 1. Now the first question I could ask is the following. I could say, Suppose I knew one of the two parameters, would that knowledge influence my knowledge about the other one? So if I knew theta zero, would that tell me something about where theta one lies? If the answer to that question is no, then it means the two parameters are independent. Remember that was somehow the hallmark of independent random variables is that if, if you impose one, it would have no effect on the probability for the other. And so if that's true, let's suppose for this example that they are independent. And so that means that the probability densities factorize. So the joint probability for both parameters is just the PDF for theta zero times the PDF for theta one. All right. I, and it's not necessarily going to be the case. You could have examples where uh, they're dependent, but uh, that would be then you'd have to build that in somehow. All right, so what am I going to use now in this example for my prior for theta zero and for theta one? Well, let's suppose that I know very little about theta zero before I do the experiment, because after all, that's the goal of the experiment is to uh, learn, some, learn about theta zero. So let me suppose that before doing the measurement, I know very little. So I should choose a very broad prior for theta zero. And uh, the limit of something broad would be just to set a constant. Now, this this can be problematic in some cases. Let's suppose that theta zero could live anywhere on the real line. Then if I tried to normalize this prior by integrating it from minus infinity to infinity, say, it wouldn't converge. And so this is what would be called an improper uh, prior. For some Bayesian applications, that's forbidden. And in others, it's allowed. And in this particular one, it works. It, it turns out that it works because in Bayes' theorem, you can see that the prior always appears multiplied by the likelihood. And so if I have a problem where the likelihood falls off fast enough as a function of the parameter, then even if this prior is not normalizable, then the product of the prior times the likelihood can result in a normalizable posterior PDF. And that turns out to be the, the case here. But take that with a warning. There are other, other applications in Bayesian statistics where you're not allowed to use uh, uh, improper priors. All right, so we'll take a constant for theta zero. How about for theta one? Well, let me suppose that what I mean by prior is prior to doing the primary measurement where I measure the y's, but after having done this control measurement where I provide some information about uh, uh, theta one. So that's what I mean by prior here. So my prior for theta one is going to be the 
posterior PDF for theta one given the control measurement. So how do I get that? Well, I get that by using the likelihood for the control measurement times the prior that was relevant even before doing the control measurement. So I'll call that the Ur prior, the, the uh, primordial uh, prior. Now, what do you take for that? Well, there, before even doing the control measurement, you really knew nothing about, uh, or very little about theta one. So for that, maybe you could take a, a constant. And if you did so, let's see, the likelihood for the control measurement, that was just a Gaussian. And you can see that if you normalize this property for a density in theta one, that constant just turns out to be one. All right, so you get a Gaussian prior for theta one. All right, so now I think I have all my ingredients. Let's see if we can put these together. All right, so uh, let's see. Bayes' theorem then says that the joint PDF for theta zero and theta one, given the measurements y, that is proportional to the likelihood. All right, so that's my product of Gaussian terms for the y sub i's times the prior. So that pi zero just reflects the constant term for theta zero. And there is the prior for theta one. Right, so you'll notice here that what I mean by the data y, here I'm, the, the data, I take that only to mean y. The information from the control measurement has been subsumed into this prior. But what's kind of interesting to notice, and you can kind of see this immediately from the mathematics, is that you would get the same result if you defined the data to mean both y and the control measurement, right? And you would then take as your prior uh, the pi zero for theta zero and this uh, constant ur prior for theta one. Right? It would just simply be a, a, a matter of lumping that onto the end, sorry, onto the end and counting that as part of the likelihood. You would wind up with the same result. So that's a, that's a, sorry, I'm making a mess here. That's a useful feature of Bayesian statistics is that the order of the measurements doesn't matter. All right, let's go on. So is that the final result? What is that? That's the joint PDF for the parameter of interest and the nuisance parameter. But I'm not interested in the nuisance parameter. I just want to know the PDF for the parameter of interest. Now, here's what's quite interesting. In a Bayesian analysis, you can do something which is forbidden in a frequentist context. Namely, you can just integrate over the nuisance parameter. Because after all, I've associated a probability with the parameters. So this is a probability density. And so I can simply marginalize over that uh, parameter. I can simply integrate over theta one. And that gives me what I call the marginal PDF for the parameter theta zero. All right, we didn't actually discuss that, but uh, uh, in any case, that is what you would call the marginal PDF obtained from this joint PDF for theta zero and theta one. All right, you're allowed to do that exactly because this is a probability and not just say a likelihood function. Now in this particular example, I've chosen simple ingredients like you know, Gaussian distributions for measurements and, and constant priors and so forth. And uh, that means that in this particular case, I can do the integral in closed form and that's quite rare. And here's what you get for the result for the uh, uh, marginal posterior PDF for theta zero given y, you wind up with a Gaussian centered about a value theta zero hat. And that theta zero hat turns out to be none other than the same. It's the same as the MLE. And then the standard deviation of this Gaussian has a certain value, which turns out to be none other than it, it's the same as the standard deviation of the MLE. And so the numbers are coming out the same. And so you might think, oh, frequentist Bayesian, who cares? It gives the same numbers. Um, so, so two things there. First of all, it doesn't always give the same number. It does in this example. Right. Um, second, remember that the interpretation of these ingredients is different in the two cases. In the Bayesian case, this posterior PDF is supposed to be interpreted as a function that uh, quantifies my degree of belief as to where uh, theta lies. Whereas in the frequentist case, theta zero hat, that was a, a, a that was itself a function of the data that followed some sampling distribution. Right, so the estimators were treated as, as random variables that follow some sample sampling distribution. That's not the same animal as the posterior PDF for the parameter. 
All right, I have a little bit more time, and I, so I want to spend that time discussing an important aspect of uh, Bayesian statistics, and that has to do with uh, marginalizing these joint PDFs. So we, we use Bayes' theorem in order to get a uh, joint PDF for all of the parameters, and we needed to reduce that to the marginal PDF for the parameter of interest. Now here I only had one, per, one nuisance parameter, but in, in some analysis you might have hundreds or thousands of nuisance parameters. And so in, furthermore, the, the uh, PDF might have some very non-trivial functional form, so you're not gonna be able to do it the integral in closed form. And furthermore, because of the high dimensionality, you wouldn't be able to do it with ordinary acceptance rejection Monte Carlo, that would become too slow. But there's a, another type of Monte Carlo algorithm called Markov chain Monte Carlo, and that is what you need to use in these types of applications. I've, I've written here that it revolutionized Bayesian computation, but that's probably because I wrote the slide 20 or 30 years ago. I, I think that, that the MCMC or Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, came into wide use in Bayesian statistics already in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so it's not that revolutionary now, but it certainly is very important. Now, one of the things that I think I can even explain in just five minutes is the most important Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm for our types of applications. And this is what's called the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And this generates a correlated sequence of random numbers. So that's different from ordinary Monte Carlo where each random value that you generate is independent. So you can't use this MCMC for, you couldn't use it, for example, in your detector Monte Carlo. You know, if you generate a random number to tell you how far a particle flies, and then another random number to tell you how it decays, you couldn't have a correlation between those. So MCMC has correlations uh, between the, the random values. It can't be used for that. But nevertheless, if what you want is a series of random values that simply computes this integral, then the correlations are not at all a problem. So here's the basic idea. The basic idea is that we have a probability density for some multi-dimensional vector of parameters. So vector theta here is just theta one and theta zero, but it could be some high dimensional parameter space. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna hop around in that parameter space according to this density, according to the probability density P of theta, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the distribution of the parameter of interest. And that, that gives me my answer directly. That does the integral by, by sampling the, the values in theta and just making a histogram of the parameter of interest. The envelope of that histogram is directly my answer. Right. Now, one of the things that's uh, useful about uh, this algorithm is that you only need to know the target probability density as a proportionality. And let me go back, you'll see that here, I haven't put in that denominator in Bayes' theorem, and that would actually have been difficult to compute. So remember what I have here is just the, what I'll call the target probability density, but I only have it as a proportionality. So let's see how this works. Let me show the, the most important algorithm, which is the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. So we have some n-dimensional PDF, and what I want to do is I want to generate a sequence of points in theta space, theta one, theta two, theta three. So you start at some point in the parameter space. I'll call that theta zero. So there, zero here denotes the point, not the component of theta. Right? And so you have to start somewhere. And then in the next step, what you do is you propose a new point theta by generating it from a PDF called the proposal density. So in addition to the target density, I need to have some other proposal density in theta, and it has to contain the previous point theta zero as a parameter. And there's a wide degree of flexibility as to what you use, but uh, it could be, for example, and often is, a Gaussian in theta centered about theta zero. So let's just think of that as the, as the example. All right, so you start at theta zero, and you then you generate with ordinary Monte Carlo um, a point theta from a Gaussian centered about theta zero. And there's some rules for how to choose the width of the Gaussian, but again, there's a great deal, deal of flexibility uh, allowed. Right, next step. We form what's called the Hastings test ratio. And that, I'll call that alpha, is the minimum of either one, 
or this particular combination, what do I have here? It's the ratio of target densities with theta upstairs and theta zero downstairs. And then I also have the ratio of the uh, proposal densities with theta zero upstairs and theta downstairs. All right, so if that's greater than one, I take alpha equals one. If it's less than one, then alpha is equal to that ratio. Next step, generate a value u, which is uniformly distributed on the interval between zero and one. And if u is less than the test ratio alpha, then for the next point in the sequence, you move to the proposed point, right? Otherwise, you repeat the old point. So it's not like acceptance rejection uh, Monte Carlo, where if you if you don't accept it, you know you just uh, ignore it and go on. No, if if you uh, uh, don't move to the proposed point, you hop in place. You repeat the old point, and that's kind of interesting because it means that if you looked at a sample of of points in parameter space generated by MCMC, you would easily be able to distinguish them from, say, uh, uh, I don't know sampled by some true random process, right? Because you wouldn't have repeat, exactly repeated points, but here you do. All right, and so that tells you how to get theta one from theta zero, and then you just iterate that algorithm, right? The theta one becomes the new, the new theta zero and you just keep on going. All right, now let's see, let me modify that. That was actually the Hastings algorithm that I just said. But um, very often what we do is we take the proposal density to have this particular symmetry Namely, it's symmetric between the argument theta and the parameter theta zero. And if you think about a Gaussian, that works, right? A, a Gaussian in theta centered about theta zero has something like a theta minus theta zero squared in it. So if you switch theta zero and theta, you get the same formula. And if the proposal density has that particular symmetry, then you'll see that, let me go back, from this Hastings test ratio, it would cancel. And so you just get this formula here, and this is this is what then defines the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, all right, is imposing this symmetry for the uh, proposal density. And so what does that say? That basically says that uh, if you propose the new point, if uh, the new point has a higher value of probability than the point where you're sitting, that means that alpha is going to be equal to one. And that means that with 100% probability, you are going to accept the proposed point. So if the, if the proposed step is to higher P of theta, you take it. If it's to lower uh, probability, then alpha is equal to that ratio then, which is somewhere between zero and one. And you accept the proposed step with that probability. And if you reject it, you hop in place. All right, so that's the Metropolis-Hastings uh, algorithm. And so here I've done that uh, with the example that we've been discussing. Here's theta zero versus uh, theta one. And if you look carefully at this, you can kind of see that these points, particularly out in the periphery, follow a kind of a trajectory. Because you can see that they have to be correlated because uh, the proposed point depends on the, on the previous point. On the other hand, if you just take all of these points and project them onto the theta zero axis, that gives me my marginal PDF of theta zero. Right? And if I normalize that appropriately to unit area, that gives me my answer. That's the marginal PDF for my parameter of interest. And of course, I'm also allowed to project them onto the axis of the nuisance parameter, and I can get its posterior PDF uh, as well if I want. All right, so um, let me make, make a, one final comment and then we'll, we'll finish up. Um, the knowledge about the nuisance parameter I've said came from a previous measurement, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you have prior knowledge about nuisance parameters that comes from some source of information that might not be uh, interpretable easily as a, as a measurement. So it could be, for example, that this nuisance parameter might reflect uh, a coefficient in a perturbation series that uh, your theorist friend is gonna compute, but they haven't computed it yet. They've done many computations that are similar, but they haven't gotten around to computing theta one. And so you go to the theorist and, and you say, well, how big do you think that this uh, theta one is going to be? Because you want to quantify its uncertainty. And first of all, the expert might, might say something like, uh, well, before I've computed it, I, I have no idea. That's not really true because the theorist probably has computed many things of a similar nature in the past. And uh, they know that if the answer isn't going to be 10 to the 40th or something if all the previous values were, were between you know, zero and 10. Um, 
So this aspect of a Bayesian analysis is what is called elicitation of expert knowledge. You, you sit the theorist down in a chair and you interrogate this, this person and you say, all right, you know, based on all of your knowledge about theta one, how big do you really think it could be? And maybe you force them to, you coerce them into drawing some kind of a curve that reflects their degree of belief. And so maybe by some symmetry argument, you know it's going to be positive, right? And, and maybe you know, you think it's not going to be less than, what did I write here, a tenth. And so the theorist sketches roughly some curve that looks like that, looks like that you know, with a mean value of a, of a tenth. They say, voila, it's an exponential distribution with a mean of one tenth. And at this point, the theorist is probably saying, no, no, I, I don't mean to be so precise. I just mean that roughly that's my, my degree of knowledge. And at this point, it's important to remember the if-then nature of Bayesian statistics. We're not saying that anybody's prior knowledge is exactly described by an exponential distribution with a, a mean of 0.1. What we're doing is we're making an if-then statement. We're saying that if this function represents your prior degree of belief, then Bayes' theorem tells you how that gets updated in the light of the data. Now, what do you do? You want your final result to be of value not only to a person whose prior degree of belief is exactly reflected by this particular prior, you want it to be of value to the broader scientific community that might have a variety of prior degrees of belief about some nuisance parameters. And so an important aspect of any Bayesian analysis is what, what's called the sensitivity analysis. You should vary the prior in some reasonable range and see what effect that has on the posterior PDF for the parameter of interest. In some cases, it might be quite decoupled. So that'd be important to know. In other cases, making a small change in the prior might make a substantial change in the posterior. In that case, you should also know that. So what I've done just in this exercise is to try different values of the mean of the exponential. And, and indeed, in this particular example, you get noticeably different posterior PDFs. And so that would have to be reported if this variation of priors was considered as, a, as reasonable. You can also, of course, try different functional forms for the priors. All right, I think I'm up to time, so I think I should, I should conclude. Um, sorry, we've only had four lectures. Uh, that forced me to, to push a certain amount of material into the extra slides, but not too much. So we, we've, we've really only seen a fairly limited subset of the interesting topics, but at least the main aspects of parameter estimation, uh, hypothesis tests, limits, systematics, uh, some mention of uh, asymptotic properties using Wilkes theorem, and, and now finally uh, Bayesian parameter estimation. This idea of student's T regression is related to using, to quantifying not only uncertainties and measurements, but the uncertainties in the uncertainties. So I call that errors on errors. And there's some material in the, in the extra slides. Let me flash maybe to that. Uh, th this is something that I've been pushing for a couple of years. And so there's a paper that I invite you to, to look at that, uh, uh, statistical models with uncertain error parameters. So it involves, at least in some joke type sense, talking about errors on errors, and it has certain interesting properties. All right, so sorry, we didn't talk about that this time. Let me leave you with one final thought, and that's the following. Is you'll see that in the last four days, there is a number of decisions that, it status, that, that the analyst has to make about the tools to use and the formalism to apply, Bayesian versus frequentist. Um, do I want to use a, a CLS limits or Feldman Cousins limits or, or the one-sided limits? All of those decisions are important and interesting, but they're perhaps not the most profitable use of your time. The place where we should be investing our time is trying to figure out what is an appropriate model for the data and how do I parameterize that? And how do I include enough parameters in this model so that I cover all of my systematic uncertainties? And how do I include enough control measurements to constrain those nuisance parameters? That's really where we should be investing our time. And these other decisions are also important, I don't get me wrong, but uh, the, the place where we should really be focusing is trying to construct uh, appropriate models that exploit all of the available information, cover all the systematic uncertainties, and constrain the nuisance parameters as well as possible. All right, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Lent, for another very nice lecture.
and wise words at the end uh, to take away. Um, okay, so this was the fourth and final lecture of Glenn, and uh, but there is still a possibility now for questions. So I invite questions to the teacher if you have any. Let's see if I can open the. Uh... So far, the chat is quiet, but uh, maybe things come up. So, Stephen, I see, has a question, raised hand. So, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Glenn. Thank you for this very, very nice set of lectures. I just have one question, which is that quite often it seems there has been maybe assumption is the wrong word, but we, we make the choice that we will be handling our nuisance parameters, our uncertainties in some type of symmetric way. And mm -hmm. quite often, I mean, we evaluate it and we don't see it as symmetric. And then you discuss briefly in the first or second lecture how we can then maybe make choices to symmetrize it. But I'm wondering how much impact does this have in the end, these choices or this belief in uh, setting our, our nuisance parameters as something symmetric rather than treating and propagating everything as something asymmetric through the whole process. That's a good point. And I, I don't know how to quantify that, unfortunately, other than to say, obviously, if that asymmetry is very small, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. But uh, very often, for example, you might have a nuisance parameter that is intrinsically positive. And so by treating that, you might be tempted in a Gaussian, in, in a Bayesian context to write down a Gaussian prior, but then you might recognize that uh, the parameter is intrinsically positive. And so what do you do then? Do you just truncate the Gaussian at zero? It turns out that that can actually lead to certain pathologies that are important, right? So truncating a Gaussian at zero, a, a Gaussian prior at zero is, is almost always not a good idea. Um, what is better to do in those cases where you do have a non-negligible asymmetry would be to use at least a parametric form that uh, respects the boundary conditions and introduces an approximate asymmetry. And one of the ways that has been used in particle physics quite widely is to um, use a log normal distribution. And the equivalent there is to assume that the uh, log of the quantity is Gaussian distributed. So in other words, if you have a, um, a quantity which is intrinsically positive, then you take the log of that quantity so that then lives on the entire real uh, line. And then you, you can model that as being Gaussian distributed. That's equivalent to a log normal distribution. Other asymmetric distributions which are used um, not infrequently are, for example, gamma distributions. But um, I don't know how to quantify uh, how big of a problem it is. I'm afraid that that's just going to have to be evaluated on a case by case basis. OK, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Any other question? Uh, Dimitri puts a question in the chat, if you can see it. Uh, I never understood why in the denominator of the Bayesian formula, it can be dropped. Doesn't it depend on the data? Yes, yes, that's right. But it doesn't depend on the parameters because I've integrated over the parameters. And at the end of the day, what I'm trying to report is a joint PDF for the parameters and that is simply normalized to unit area when integrated over all of the parameters. Right, so, so the x's are constants if, if I say what I'm wanting want is just a function of the parameters, right, because it has then a, this normalization constraint. Okay, and Maria also put a question. For a Bayesian approach, does it make sense to convert the log likelihood function to a chi-squared and then to p-values? Hmm. Well, then you wouldn't be using, let me go back. If you have the log likelihood function, that is, that is, is the fundamental ingredient for both camps, right? For both the Bayesian and the frequentist. And so, yes, if you have that, you can say, forget the Bayesian stuff, go, go uh, use method of least squares or whatever and compute p-values. You are, you are perfectly entitled to do that. Um, but uh, uh, then, then you're, you're no longer being Bayesian. Okay. Anything else? This is your last chance, at least during the lecture recordings. In fact, Len, I'm, I'm not sure we, we mentioned the Asimov data set a few times. If you 
explained where this name comes from because it's kind of amusing <laughs> and uh, so um, and, and it's one of my favorite writers. Uh, so uh, so, so uh, Isaac Asimov, of course, is the the science fiction writer, and he wrote a, a story, I think, in the nineteen forties, maybe fifties, called Franchise, and the story is kind of interesting. Uh, it uh, describes the far future of two thousand eight. And in 2008, there was the presidential election. And um, the uh, world at that point, uh, elections by actually voting, that had become too expensive. And so they didn't do that anymore. And so what they had instead was a super duper computer. Uh, and this computer was capable of locating the most average typical person in the country. Right? In the story, his name was Norman. Right? And so you find this one guy and you sit him down in a room and you ask him, what is your view on tax policy? What is your view on defense policy and so forth? And then, so instead of having to have this expensive election where you interrogate every um, member of the population, you only have one representative person. And that guy is the proxy for the whole country. And so uh, it, it, it is in that sense that rather than have the data, we, we replace the data by a single representative value. And so we call that the Asimov, uh, the Asimov data set. So Asimov is a data set. There you go. <laughs> we could have called it the Norman data set because that was the name of the guy in the story, but nobody's heard of him, so. <laughs> right, all right, thanks. I, I see Maria still has a, a follow-up comment on her question. My question was motivated by the fact that p-values are usually used to quantify agreement with a given model Hmm. So the equivalent thing in Bayesian statistics that you use to quantify your degree of belief in a model is the posterior probability. All right, basta. That's, that's, uh, so if you want to say that if you get a posterior probability for a certain hypothesis of 7%, well, that's your degree of belief that that hypothesis is true. Um, so that's not what the p-value is. There's another construct in Bayesian statistics, which is widely used, called the Bayes factor. And that's like a likelihood ratio. Um, and it turns out to be the ratio of posterior probabilities if your prior probabilities were equal for a pair of, of hypotheses. That's a different thing. It hasn't really caught on so much in particle physics, but some. And actually, there are some new and, and very useful tools for computing base factors. And perhaps we should go in that direction. But I haven't had a, a chance in, in these four lectures to talk about that yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see we exhausted the questions. So I hope we haven't too much exhausted you, Glenn, but you thanks have. a lot. I am exhausted. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for all these lectures. We planned this already in 2019, I remember, but then due to circumstances, here we are. So I'm happy we could have them finally. And uh, thanks for everybody who attended, particularly who uh, spent the whole four lectures through and I hope they were helpful for statistics, for uh, your statistics uh, problems. And um, that's where we're going to end. So uh, thanks, everybody. This is the end of this academic training. If you like it, next week we have academic training on dark matter. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.